anybody has glanced ahead at the reading but I just took a gander at it this morning and uh, thought to myself yeah uh, nah, I'm not uh, feeling uh, like we ought to read that out loud but I was also thinking it seems like we ought to read it together so that was my quandary I don't think we should read it out loud but we should read it together how can we accomplish that when I discovered that the good people at uh, NIV uh, have put up a YouTube video with it being read. And so I thought maybe, just maybe, we might benefit from listening and reading rather than reading and reading. So let me uh, let me go ahead and see if I'm on the right docket here. Is it November 13th where you are? I know it's cold. Yes. We all agree that we got November 13th. Well, then, with no further ado, let's just dive right on in and lean into our little a little help from our friends over here at, uh, at NIV. All right, ready. On your mark, get set. Chapter 26. After the plague, the Lord said to Moses and Eleazar, son of Aaron the priest, take a census of the whole Israelite community by families, all those 20 years old or more, who were able to serve in the army of Israel. So on the plains of Moab, by the Jordan across from Jericho, Moses and Eleazar the priest spoke with them and said, Take a census of the men twenty years old or more, as the Lord commanded Moses. These were the Israelites who came out of Egypt. The descendants of Reuben, the firstborn son of Israel, were, through Hanuk, the Hanukite clan, through Palu, the Paluite clan, through Hezron, the Hezronite clan, through Carmi, the Carmite clan. These were the clans of Reuben. Those numbered were 43,730. The son of Palu was Eliab, and the sons of Eliab were Nemuel, Dathan, and Abiram. The same Dathan and Abiram were the community officials who rebelled against Moses and Aaron and were among Korah's followers when they rebelled against the Lord. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed them along with Korah, whose followers died when the fire devoured the 250 men, and they served as a warning sign. The line of Korah, however, did not die out. The descendants of Simeon by their clans were, through Nemuel, the Nemuelite clan, through Jamin, the Jamnite clan, through Jachin, the Jachinite clan, through Zerah, the Zerahite clan, through Shaul, the Shaulite clan. These were the clans of Simeon. There were 22,200 men. The descendants of Gad by their clans were, through Zephon, the Zephonite clan, through Haggai, the Haggite clan, through Shuni, the Shunite clan, through Ozni, the Oznite clan, through Eri, the Erite clan, through Arodi, the Arodite clan, through Areli, the Erelite clan. These were the clans of Gad, those numbered were 40,500. Er and Onan were sons of Judah, but they died in Canaan. The descendants of Judah by their clans were through Shela, the Shelanite clan, through Perez, the Perizzite clan, through Zerah, the Zerahite clan. The descendants of Perez were through Hezron, the Hezronite clan, through Hamul, the Hamulite clan. These were the clans of Judah, those numbered were 76,500. The descendants of Issachar by their clans were through Tola, the Toalite clan, through Pua, the Puite clan, through Joshub, the Joshubite clan, through Shimron, the Shimronite clan. These were the clans of Issachar, those numbered were 64,300. The descendants of Zebulun by their clans were through Sered, the Seredite clan, through Elon, the Elonite clan, through Jahlil, the Jahlilite clan. These were the clans of Zebulun, those numbered were 60,500. The descendants of Joseph by their clans through Manasseh and Ephraim were the descendants of Manasseh, through Machir, the Machirite clan, Machir was the father of Gilead, through Gilead, the Gileadite clan. 
These were the descendants of Gilead, through Eazer, the Eazerite clan, through Halek, the Halekite clan, through Azriel, the Azraelite clan, through Shechem, the Shechemite clan, through Shemida, the Shemidaite clan, through Hefer, the Heferite clan. Zelophadad, son of Hefer, had no sons. He had only daughters whose names were Mala, Noah, Hogla, Milka, and Tirza. These were the clans of Manasseh. Those numbered were 52,700. These were the descendants of Ephraim by their clans. Through Shuthela, the Shuthelahite clan, through Beker, the Bekerite clan, through Tachan, the Tachanite clan. These were the descendants of Shuthela, through Aaron, the Aaronite clan. These were the clans of Ephraim, those numbered were 32,500. These were the descendants of Joseph by their clans. The descendants of Benjamin by their clans were through Bela, the Belaite clan, through Ashbel, the Ashbelite clan, through Ahiram, the Ahiramite clan, through Shufam, the Shufamite clan, through Hufam, the Hufamite clan. The descendants of Bela through Ard and Naaman were through Ard, the Ardite clan, through Naaman, the Naamite clan. These were the clans of Benjamin, those numbered were 45,600. These were the descendants of Dan by their clans, through Shuham, the Shuhamite clan. These were the clans of Dan, all of them were Shuhamite clans, and those numbered were 64,400. The descendants of Asher by their clans were, through Imna, the Imnite clan, through Ishvi, the Ishvite clan, through Baraya, the Berite clan, and through the descendants of Baraya, through Eber, the Eberite clan, through Malkiel, the Malkielite clan. Asher had a daughter named Sarah. These were the clans of Asher, those numbered were 53,400. The descendants of Naphtali by their clans were, through Jazil, the Jazilite clan, through Guni, the Gunite clan, through Jezer, the Jezerite clan, through Shilem, the Shilamite clan. These were the clans of Naphtali, those numbered were 45,400. The total number of the men of Israel was 601,730. The Lord said to Moses, the land is to be allotted to them as an inheritance based on the number of names. To a larger group, give a larger inheritance, and to a smaller group, a smaller one. Each is to receive its inheritance according to the number of those listed. Be sure that the land is distributed by lot. What each group inherits will be according to the names for its ancestral tribe. Each inheritance is to be distributed by lot among the larger and smaller groups. These were the Levites who were counted by their clans. Through Gershon, the Gershonite clan. Through Kohath, the Kohathite clan. Through Marari, the Mararite clan. These also were Levite clans, the Libnite clan, the Hebraite clan, the Malite clan, the Mushite clan, the Korahite clan. Kohath was the forefather of Amram. The name of Amram's wife was Jacobed, a descendant of Levi who was born to the Levites in Egypt. To Amram she bore Aaron, Moses, and their sister Miriam. Aaron was the father of Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. But Nadab and Abihu died when they made an offering before the Lord with unauthorized fire. All the male Levites a month old or more numbered 23,000. They were not counted along with the other Israelites because they received no inheritance among them. These are the ones counted by Moses and Eleazar the priest when they counted the Israelites on the plains of Moab by the Jordan across from Jericho. Not one of them was among those counted by Moses and Aaron the priest when they counted the Israelites in the desert of Sinai. For the Lord had told those Israelites they would surely die in the desert, and not one of them was left except Caleb son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, son of Nun. All right. Well, I I don't know why we, we were intimidated to take that on. That seemed relatively, relatively, uh, oh man, I'm just glad we didn't do that. I, I, there's, uh, there's, no, there's no easy way to jump through that many names from my mouth, so. Uh, before we do anything, jump out at you as we were reading those names that you found riveting or uh, surprising. I guess somebody did put in the comments, and maybe it was Bob, 
um, just the fact that there still were such a great number of people, even after all of the um, different, I think I'm going to use Bob's word, purges and things that had happened. And even it did strike me that like we talked about, I can't remember which clan and which group of people that um, did die basically as an example of, of God keeping his word to the people. Yeah. Anna, anything pop for you? No, except for the way that he was able to pronounce all of those names, and and I know that I could not. Yeah, well, I, and I'm uh, and I'm happy to to say that uh, that Todd probably could have nailed that with yes. uh, right. as much ease. I don't know how he does it, but his uh, his eyes have a tendency to put the right enunciation to those words. It's amazing. Right you know the interesting thing for me is the the lineage and and the way that they managed to keep all of that um information without a computer because we certainly can't seem to do it today you know without the help of our computers but they didn't have that and, and they have it down pat it's fascinating yeah jenny they mentioned the clans that had no sons but but listed his daughters uh, that's, I think, I'm, I'm not sure if what we're supposed to know about that, but I'm glad that that happened for some reason. I'm not even hundred percent sure why I feel good about that, but it was nice mm -hmm. seeing that. Yeah. Uh, how important for military purpose was it to know how many men Israel had for them in their day, do you imagine? And why do you think so? Why, why did they want to know who was the fighting aged men as they went through some of these uh, censuses that we've been reading? In preparation for battle, um, having that information, you know, beforehand, um, because if you don't have that many and you go in, everybody's going to be wiped out. So if you, uh, before you go into battle, you certainly have to know how many uh, available people that you'll have uh, to fight, otherwise you'll perish. There's a there's a spot in the Bible where uh, in the Gospels where Jesus is telling uh, the crowd a, a, a story essentially, and he, you know, he says, you know, imagine a man who builds a tower but doesn't doesn't count the the amount of money he has. You know, how would he be be seen by people if he uh, he builds a tower and he doesn't have the resources to finish it? Or he said, imagine a man who sends 20,000 men out to battle to meet an army of 50,000 men. Right. Uh, in both of those cases, that was uh, Herod Antipas who had done those very things. And, uh, and Jesus was mocking uh, Herod Antipas to the, to the crowd. It's like, you know, who'd you go out to the wilderness to see? You know, did you go to see a reed blowing in the wind, you know, and Back in those days, uh, Reed was the symbol of, of Herod Antipas uh, and a politician, a, a politician just blowing in the wind. Did you, he can't make up his mind going to and fro, or did you go out to see John the Baptist, right? I mean, and so he makes these, these, these statements, uh, but what was interesting about that in relationship to what we're talking about here is, you know, it, it's like there is a foolishness to leadership when leadership isn't aware of the assets that are available to it to accomplish the tasks that mm -hmm. are aligned before that leader, right? And the mismanagement of, of those assets, people assets, resource, money resources, uh, tools, you know, when you, when you underestimate the resources that are available to you to accomplish a task, it can limit or expand your horizon for accomplishment. And, uh, and I think, uh, when you are mismanaging the details, the minutia of, of what you have, uh, Jesus had fun pointing the finger at a, a leader, a king, who was so self-consumed, had no notion of what really it took to get some things done that were important. It was interesting. No, go ahead, honey. Oh, Anna, you can. I was just thinking kind of along those same lines that it's important as far as like even like when we talk about just the military itself, like to be able to strategize and just like you were saying, Mark, if you don't know what resources you have, you can either um, 
your strategy just won't be as effective. You're going to send people that aren't ready, or you could have done something um, better planned with the number that you do have. If you did have a large number, you could divide and conquer or whatever the strategies are. But if you don't have that information, then you're um, not acting on, on data. Data is right. important. Uh, interestingly enough, a phrase that we've uh, kicked around a long time at the Journey North is facts are our friends. Uh, and sometimes the facts aren't always friendly, but the facts right. themselves are here to serve us. You know, we have to know what's true. Uh, and getting to the, to the point of what's true really matters. How did Moses have to depend on his leaders uh, to help with the census? So... Yeah, all of the try, and it's just that piece of communication um, is a big piece. Like just being able to get the word to that many people, I would imagine that as he's having to rely on the leaders and to have that accurate plan, they had to be able to know exactly what their plan was to be able to execute it all the same um, and to get the information correctly. Yeah, when we came into the pandemic, uh, you know, it was. Um, a really interesting, I had a couple really uh, interesting conversations with people because uh, pastors, other pastors, um, and you know, they, you know, this isn't, uh, you know, shame on them or anything like that. They just never had valued counting their people or knowing uh, where their people were, who was really committed to the church or what, whatever the case was. And, and I've always kind of gathered data. I'm like, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I like <laughs> I count everything. And so uh, the the pandemic came and one of the really, really quick decisions that we made was to buy Bibles for all of our, our key people and then deliver them. Mm -hmm. Well, I was surprised, and this came as a, a, a pretty significant surprise at how many pastors as we were talking about gathering uh, d different pastors together to say, how are you going to handle this? How are, what are we doing that might be, you know, reproducible? How are we going to navigate that? Uh, how many of them didn't, didn't really know? Uh, they were like, how, how do you, how did you do that? I mean, how do you, what's, how did that happen? You know, how did you get that information so quickly? I'm like, uh, well, we had the, <laughs> the information ahead of time. We know who, who typically attends. It's always uh, unfortunate. And, and this is where, uh, it, 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 as I was looking at the question, it kind of stung a little bit, but there, there's somebody that, you know, they haven't for a variety of reasons showing up in our system, uh, but they've been attending for a long time. And I should have recognized that I didn't, I missed them. And, uh, and so some months went by when I got a, a letter that was fairly confrontational, like, They've been hearing about all this good stuff that's happening, phone calls that are being made, people that are being cared for, Bible study that's being read, Bibles that were given, signs in people's yards. And they've been coming for a long time and, and no one did anything for them. And I'm like, wow, how did we miss them? Because uh, I, I, if, I, if I just sat from the pulpit and kind of scanned the audience, I can, I can tell you exactly where they typically sit, you know, and so... It's like, I don't, I don't know how they, I didn't think about them, but uh, somehow they had never registered for anything, signed up for anything, shown up in our system in any way. And when we went to get the data, uh, it, it got missed. Uh, and, uh, and uh, again, just when you have a lot of pieces, having it written down matters. And I don't know how many times I've, I've thought to myself in the course of the day, you know what, I need to get this one thing done, or I need to check this one thing. Uh, Elizabeth has had a tire on the back of her, her vehicle that's been going flat. Uh, I'm not sure why, but we've taken it in a couple of times and so it continues to, to go flat. And a couple of days ago, I was thinking, man, I wonder how that tire is in the back. I should check that. And I was driving and I got out and walked away from the car, got in, walked away from the car. I'm driving down the road going, man, I got to think about checking that tire and seeing how that is. Got out, walked away from the car, got back in, and I'm driving. I'm driving down the road thinking, this is like the third or fourth time that I've thought to myself, I need to check the, the how this tire is doing. It's cold out and I don't want to get stranded, right? And so I pulled off to the side of the road. My kids are like, what are you doing? I'm like, ah, I want to check the tire. Um, and tire's fine. But 
the the point for me what in that is that so often the time I think about some, doing something that that it pops into my mind, and the time that some distance goes down the road, I lose it. I lose it. And so the recording of information, the writing it down, the the capturing uh, of these things uh, really matters. And and it matters more, I think, with people than with hires, right? <clears throat> like if you don't write it down, it's hard to necessarily keep that straight. But I've had some people that have said over the course of the time, you know, I don't want to be a number at a church. I don't want to go and just be a number. Well, yeah, no kidding. But uh, at the same time, I want to be important enough that they would write my name down. And one of the things I love about uh, the Bible is uh, there's this thing called the Lamb's Book of Life. That when you give your life to Christ, your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And uh, and then we see places like this in the scripture where you can go, okay, wait, whatever else is going on here, uh, God cared about the details down to some specific clans and some specific people. People matter enough to God that they got written down. And, uh, and you matter enough to God that the Bible says your name, when you give your life to Christ, was written down. Uh, and uh, uh, there's not a name there. There's no church that I want my name recorded on more than I want my re name recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life. And uh, so, Amen. Amen. Yeah. It's interesting when when we talked about when you just talked about having collected data in a computer. Yeah. That one, you know, they didn't have a computer. They did it visually, right. and, and did all the recordings. And we have all the sophisticated information. And even with that we miss that one that doesn't uh, allow themselves in the, in the computer. Just interesting. Right. And, and, you know, there's a lot, a lot of people that have all kinds of reasons why they just don't want to be part of that. And right. I get it. That's fine. But what happens <laughs> if you don't want us to know is we might miss and, right. uh, and it's a horrible thing to miss. I feel terrible about missing. Uh, but I, I miss cause you know what I, I, I'm, I, uh, I epitify human <laughs> it's like, and, and broken human. I am, I, I nail it. And that's the one thing I, it's the one thing on my job description that I've gotten really right over the years, broken person failing at stuff, but uh, let, thankfully God has been gracious to us. So, huh? all right, uh, let me take a gander. We've got um, another one. What is it important about knowing who goes to, well, I guess that was part of we what, covered it. Right? but yeah. is there other things that you can think of about what, what's good about being known or? I think it's just important, like, I guess we've kind of touched on it, but really even just to know those in attendance, one for their skills and talents and the gifts they have mm -hmm. to share, as well as those ways that we can all minister to each other in the congregation, how we can all be active members and how, what people's needs might be. And at any given time, when you have that community, like our church is, you take care of the people and it's mem the members that are a part of that, that part of that church family. And by knowing who's there, you know, the ups and downs that people are experiencing mm -hmm. at any time in their lives and how to be present for them. How do you guys think that the culture that we have that, I mean, you know, what's, what's fascinating. And this is a, a, a thing in leadership. That's just always true is that culture trumps everything. The culture trump your, the culture of your church, the culture of your family, uh, our family culture trumps any rule that Elizabeth and I ever put down. Right. It's like the culture trumps rules. It trumps everything. Uh, so developing the kind of culture, uh, that you want to have really matters. And, and I think some of the things that we're trying to do runs counter to our societal culture. And one of the big things that runs counter to our societal count culture is belonging and independence. How do you see independence as affecting our, our cultural <laughs> desire for independence affecting the kind of community that God might want us to have. I think that we're, we have a sense of belonging, like what they're talking about and being able to, um, I think we're stronger together. Remember you did that series one time, better together, stronger together. And I think there's 
something to be said for that. When we work together as a body, and that's what he intended for us to work together as a body and not singularly, we're stronger together. Mm. We're more effective together. And yet there's this pull to, to you know, I think ever since, what is it, the 50s or what would they point to, you know, the 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 development of the suburbs and the garages and the, with garage door openers and then the addition of readily accessible televisions that, I mean, we've just kind of become increasingly in an inclusive way, uh, you know, isolated people, you know, where uh, mm -hmm. You drive, you drive up, you hit the button, you pull in, you pull the, hit the button, you, show, you know, you shut yourself in and, and, uh, and then you get up the next day and you do it again. And there's a lack of reliance on your neighbors, the lack of reliance on the, uh, the, you know, the, what, what we might have in the past called fraternities, you know, where, you know, you, there was a moment in time in, in culture where there was gatherings of groups for all kinds of reasons, Sons of Norway, uh, you know, the Elks Lodge, you know, uh, all these gatherings, the church have been on a sharp decline uh, for, you know, the better part of 50 years. Uh, and what, we, what we're about to come to a realization of in this season is that that sharp decline accelerated massively in COVID, uh, the, the acceleration of independence and individualism and hibernation, apart from it being 50 below zero today. I mean, it, it just, it, it, it accelerated because of COVID. People got really, really comfortable in isolation. And isolation is, is a counter in our culture right now to the, to the notion of what the church calls people to be belonging, community, commitment, connected, uh, all the, all those verbs that we think of when we think of what it, what does it mean to be the church are under attack because of the normative culture that's, that's been, you know, enhanced and excited by this, uh, pandemic. And yet at the same time, we've seen a huge increase and maybe this speaks to the issue of mental health concerns for people because that isolation isn't mm -hmm. what's intended by God. When we can do Instacart and I mean, it's kept us all safe in this little bubble, but at the same time, when we're so isolated, we've completely missed. And that's your point. The whole um, point of, of of God is that we are connected people that we're looking out for one another. It's hard to know when we're so independent. And, and that's the point too, when our culture really has this um, strong belief and you're reinforced if you are this independent person and you've done it on your own and you've gotten things, you don't need anyone. Well, then at the same time, you really actually are missing out so much on that piece that, um, God wants us all to be connected. That's, I think it's so important that our church keeps that as the culture, that we are that group that goes out and serves at Ruby's Pantry, or you are the group that has a prayer circle that anybody can join at any time, that we have this group to be able to learn and go, like spread the word together. <clears throat> no, I just agree about the community, you know, in the belonging. And when people don't feel like that they belong, when they feel like that they have been skipped or missed or they're not part of it, um, there's something lacking um, in their life that permeates through, you know, their immediate family, through their community, through their jobs, when you don't have that sense of belonging um, and, and being together. I read something recently, and I, and I apologize, I think it was Stetzer and the Billy Graham uh, Association Center, and I, and I, uh, and they, there were, at any rate, there was a study that was done that uh, seems to be indicating a direct correlation from uh, the last nine months of church attendance and mental health, that uh, the numbers for those who are attending uh, are markably different from those who aren't, and uh, to Jody, your point, I think there is a there is a uh, perhaps an increased body of of 
data, because facts are our friends, that seem right. to suggest that the belonging together in uh, this moment in time matters more than people have even come yes. close to recognizing. Uh, I think we'll find more out about that in the course of the next mm -hmm. months and years. What happens when people get lost in the crowd at church? There's a there's a there's a tr really truly uh, kind of a tragic experience I think that a lot of people have when they come into a place where they have an expectation of connection, they have an expectation of the possibility of being loved. There's this this sense of I I hope and I expect to to be acknowledged, and then they wind up leaving more alone from the experience in the crowd than they might have been had they stayed at home you know that if somebody has a bad church experience if they get lost in the mix <clears throat> whether their fault or the fault of the church or a combination of you know if their expectations was um uh, somewhat something but they don't convey those expectations you can't ever meet those expectations for one thing if they're looking for something that they don't find it can scar them or affect the entire rest of their life mm -hmm. um, and they spread it, you know, they spread it. It becomes a pain so deep, a scar so deep that it's not um, easily healed. Mm -hmm. um, Bruce and I had the opportunity during this pandemic early on, um, it was requested that we meet with a, a, a couple um, because they had some questions um, about the way things were being done, you know, when the pandemic started and you were making phone calls and uh, all the all the pastors were and all that was being done. And this couple was so upset. They were so hurt, so upset because they had an expectation that nobody knew about. And uh, meeting those expectations made them feel like they were a part of, like they belonged, like they were important, they mattered. <clears throat> and for the hours that Bruce and I talked to them and he uh, explained all the facts that we had, what we knew, uh, it didn't satisfy because they were wounded. They were wounded and they could not heal in that time that we were with them. And um, it can last a lifetime. It can change and last a lifetime. And then they live more isolated because they don't belong to the next church. And, you know, as we talk about the communities and, you know, where we are with separation, when the churches closed, I think it's an interesting fact to look at that mm -hmm. our country, our community, our states have never been more divided than what they are now mm -hmm. when our churches closed down. And we have never made it back together. And there's lots of reasons. But I think not having the church as our foundation was separated us, even in our own church, even at the Journey North. We, we, were, we were divisive and we moved away from each other. Just thoughts. Yeah, it's. Uh, I'm always amazed at the 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 level of of divisiveness or divisiveness that uh, that people can move towards, and it's almost a, always a result of of feeling hurt, like you said. Because yeah. what else, whatever else is true, uh, hurt people, hurt people. Yes. <laughs> so, so therein lies a, a core truth. What hap What makes it necessary to have strong leadership with large groups of people, do you think? I think we've touched on some of the things. I just think of that importance of communication. When you have strong leadership and there's large groups of people, how important the communication is um, and just even being able to um, delegate a strong leader is has is that overarching symbol of what's important to you if you think of your, your church and that mission and that piece but also then being able to um delegate to other leaders into different groups knowing you can't do it all when you have such mm -hmm. a large group but being that center organizer or the one the hub i guess the person that really all of the spokes come out from that strong leader and then you can 
I think just part of it is, I, I don't know, sometimes I feel like I'm a little bit of a Pollyanna, that, but th those hurt people do continue with the more, and I'll go back to data for some reason this morning, but the more data points you can collect, whether you're a hurt person or whether you're the leader collecting all of the data, that's where you then formulate your decisions that, that you make and the next actions that you take. So hopefully when you're that strong leader of a large group, you keep having that constant um, examples and that the that you keep going back to what your core and your mission is so that people can see that sometimes we might falter, we might have a difference of opinion, like we did with whether you wear masks or not when you come to church and who's gonna make these decisions and things like that. But if you keep your constant, if you're always under that umbrella of what your mission is and your vision, then you're gonna keep getting those I don't, I don't know what I'm saying, I guess. I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll go from there. You guys take it. <laughs> Max are our friends. Uh, yep. the, the, the only thing that, um, that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about when it comes to the journey north in this moment is uh, how it is that in this next season uh, will we choose to lean into each other or and how will you as potential uh, you know, regular participants at the church lean into this season in a way that allows um, your life to reflect uh, one that doesn't look at all like the Israelites in the desert, right? We don't want to do, we don't want to do the grumbling and we want to lead people away from that. We don't want to do isolation as our culture now is directing, but rather uh, a sense of belonging and community. How do you do that? And uh, how can you support uh, the church in the season of trying to gather people into a place of meaningful connection with one another, meaningful connection with God. And if those of you who are here that have been particularly walking with uh, this season uh, through the regular uh, saturation of the Word of God can be stoworks and lights into this dark season, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to help immeasurably. Uh, what I do know is that this morning as I uh, got up and I was getting my coffee, uh, a crest of orange light was uh, seen at a quarter to seven over the horizon. It is getting better and it is getting better every day. And for those of you who appreciate the light and, uh, and can get a sense of uh, the value of that, uh, keep allowing the, the spring to, as, it's, as we move towards it, to give you a picture of the future for our church as well that uh, we're in a dark season coming out of COVID and coming out of this thing. And leadership changes are on our horizon, but uh, but that this is God's church and, and he wants you to be an integral part of helping people connect with each other and with him. And if we can decide to lean into that concept and do that together, it'll make all the difference in the world. Father God, I just thank you so much for your love for each of us uh, that you have for those who have given uh, their lives to you, you have promised to write their names into the Lamb's Book of Life. And that uh, luckily your uh, data angels, they don't mess up and they don't make mistakes. And we can, uh, we can rest in the assurance of knowing that we are known by you and loved by you more than we could ever imagine. Help us walk in the real truth of that reality today. In Jesus name, amen. Amen. Thank you, gang. Make it a great day. See ya. Bye, guys. Thanks, ladies. <laughs>